All right. What we want to do, first of all, is to review what we studied in our session this morning. And you're going to help me with the review. First question, how many stages to the judgment? <clears throat> Three. Very well. What is the first? Investigative. Investigative. Where does it take place? Yeah. Who is examined? Only those who claimed the name of Jesus. What's the second stage? The verdict. The sentence, in other words. When is the sentence given? When every case has been examined. Then, the kingdom now belongs to Jesus because his kingdom is made up. His kingdom is his people. Does that make sense? And then what's the third stage? The third stage is when the saints actually take over with Christ the kingdom. Empirically. In practice. So, where is the verdict given? In heaven. The investigation takes place where? And where does the last stage of the judgment take place? On earth. Because it's when God's people actually take over the kingdom with Christ. Is that so difficult to understand? It's all there in Daniel 7. Now the second question is, how many books do we find in the book of Daniel? <clears throat> Two. What is the first one? Daniel 1 through 7. You remember we drew the parallels? between the, on the same branches, 2 and 7, 3 and 6, 4 and 5. And at the top of the candelabrum you have the uh, introduction to the book, Daniel 1. It's perfectly symmetrical, the first half of the book of Daniel. That's one book, self-contained. The second book is Daniel 8 through 12. Now, this morning as we were ending, we were studying reasons why uh, the little book of Daniel 12 verse 4 is not the totality of the book of Daniel. Remember that? Because it would be very easy for us to say, well, you know, when God told Daniel, um, close the book, seal the book, till the time of the end, uh, he was to telling him to seal the entire book of Daniel. But we gave three reasons this morning why it's not all of Daniel that's being sealed back there in 535 BC, but it's only the portion of Daniel that has to do with the ending of the 2300 days and the beginning of the judgment. Very well. What was the first reason? The first hint that we're dealing with two books. There, there's a difference in what? There's a difference in language. Two through seven is in what language? Aramaic. And the last chapters, chapter 8 through 12, are in Hebrew. Hebrew. Would that seem to hint that you have two sections to the book? Absolutely. Second reason. What was the second reason? Could many parts of Daniel be understood before the time of the end? Yes. Could the whole line of prophecy be understood before the time of the end? Yes. Could people understand the lion? Yes. Could they understand the bear? Yes. Could they understand the leopard? Yes. Could they understand the dragon beast? Yes. Could they understand the ten horns? Could they understand the little horn? Yes. Sure. All of that could be understood before the time of the end. Could they understand the 70 weeks? Yes. Sure. How about the ram of Daniel 8? Yes. Yeah. How about the he-goat of Daniel 8? Sure. All of that could be understood. What could not be understood until the time of the end was when the 2300 day prophecy would come to an end and when the judgment would begin. Because that was going to happen at the time of the end. So the culmination of the prophetic chain is what could not be understood. That's what's sealed. But the events that lead up to that could be understood before the time of the end. So it's the time element. Ellen White says that the unsealing of a book was the message with regard to time. The 2300 day prophecy. And we gave a third reason. What was the third reason? Why we know that it's not all of Daniel but it's just a portion of Daniel. We read several statements from Ellen White where she says that the little book that was sealed is that part of the book of Daniel, that portion of the book of Daniel that deals with the last days and with the judgment. So the spirit of prophecy confirms that. 
Now we have two further reasons. Uh, the first of those reasons, number four, is going to take us uh, quite a significant amount of time. And the fifth reason is what we're going to be studying in the several sessions that we have ahead of us. I'm hoping tonight we'll be able to get to Revelation chapter 10 and at least introduce some aspects of Revelation 10. But um, the fourth reason why we know that it is the portion of Daniel that has to do with the last days, with the ending of the 2300 days, with the beginning of the judgment, is by examining the internal evidence of the book. In other words, all we have to do is study Daniel 8 through 12, what's contained in those chapters. And when you look at those chapters, you discover that every single chapter has a central theme. And that central theme to which every chapter points is the fulfillment of the 2300 day prophecy. Every chapter has to do with that specific point, which means that Daniel 8 through 12 has a central theme. It is a book within a book. Are you with me or not? Now, let's examine the internal evidence of Daniel 8 through 12 to see if the central theme of all of these chapters is the ending of the 2300 days and the beginning of the investigative judgment that was described in Daniel 7. Uh, did, uh, we, we mentioned Hippolytus. You remember we talked about Hippolytus, this um, church father that lived in the third century. Uh, did he pretty much understand Daniel 2 and Daniel 7? Yes. Sure. What didn't he understand? How did he think, what did he think about the judgment? What was the judgment according to him? The judgment was when Jesus would come to judge the world, the second coming. Did he understand the very last part of Daniel 7? He understood everything up to the Antichrist. This little horn is the Antichrist, which is going to arise. He understood all of that in the third century. But what he did not understand, he shows it by his writing, is he did not understand that the judgment was going to take place in heaven. It was not going to take place on earth. Very clearly, it's the, the point that was going to take place at the end of time that could not be understood until the time of the end. So let's examine chapter by chapter. We'll go first of all to Daniel chapter 8. You have it here on the screen. Sorry, we ran out of syllabuses. Um, I did not lack faith. I lacked space in my suitcase. <laughs> or else I would have brought more because we're going to Christchurch from here. and I'm going to present this series down there. And, uh, you know, they're going to hear that you got your syllabuses here. Probably not going to be happy campers. <laughs> but anyway, we're going to make arrangements with, uh, with the manager of the book, uh, book and Bible house to uh, get more syllabuses so that everybody can have one. So let's examine first of all Daniel chapter 8. Daniel 8 presents a sequence of events that in many ways are parallel to Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. Now let's look at this chain of events that lead us from the Persian kingdom all the way till the beginning of the judgment. First of all you have a ram with two horns. What does the ram with two horns represent at the beginning of chapter 8? Clearly, verse 20 says it's the Medes and Persians. Um, and then you have a he-goat. What kingdom is represented by the he-goat? Greece. You don't have to guess. We're told that in Daniel chapter 8, verse 20, that the he-goat is Greece. Then the he-goat has a notable horn. What does that notable horn represent? It represents the first king. Clearly it's uh, the dynasty. It says so there in Daniel 8. And who was the first king? Alexander the Great. And then it says that that horn is broken and four horns come up in its place. What does that represent? It represents the divisions of the Grecian Empire after the death of Alexander the Great. Are you following me or not? By the way, the four horns are parallel to the four heads of the leopard. Let me ask you, is a leopard a pretty swift animal? But you know, this he-goat is so fast that he doesn't even touch the ground, it says in Daniel chapter 8. So you have emphasis. By the way, the leopard also has wings. So if you have a leopard and he has wings, that's pretty fast. But the, but the he-goat is just as fast because it flies over the earth, doesn't even touch the earth. So, so basically, you have the Medo-Persian kingdom, the Grecian kingdom, the first king, the four divisions into which the kingdom was divided, and then you have a little horn. And in a little while I'm going to tell you something more about this little horn. But the little horn, first of all, represents secular Rome. 
It represents political Rome. Because everything the little horn does is, is to extend its power uh, horizontally. In other words, it's conquering directions of the compass. Um, but then this little horn morphs. In other words, this little, little horn transforms itself into a religious power that attacks the prince of the sanctuary and the sanctuary in heaven. So the little horn first of all starts out as political Rome, but then it morphs into religious Rome. Is that the picture we have in Daniel 7? You have a fourth beast, dragon beast, which is the Roman Empire, and then what rises from the head of that dragon beast? A little horn. And everything this little horn does is religious. It persecutes the saints of the Most High. It thinks it can change the law of the Most High. It speaks blasphemies against the Most High. Suddenly Rome is no longer extending itself geographically. It is extending itself vertically even unto heaven and attacking God and His people. And then the next scene that we have in Daniel chapter 8 is the expression unto 2300 days and the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Let me ask you, what was the next event after the little horn in Daniel 7? Remember Daniel 7 after the little horn ruled for time, times, the dividing of time? What was the next event? The judgment, right? So what would we expect the 2300 days, the cleansing of the sanctuary to be, if Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 are parallel? It must be, the 2300 days must refer to the beginning of what? It must refer to the beginning of the judgment. Now, the vision of Daniel 8, the vision of Daniel 8 lasts then, from when? From the time of the ram, from the Persian kingdom, to the end of the 2300 days. That's the sweep of the vision of Daniel chapter 8. From Persia all the way till the ending of the 2300 days when the judgment will begin. Um, when, the, when the ending point is reached, then the 2300 days are finished, then the cleansing of the sanctuary begins. But we have a problem in Daniel 8. There is no beginning point for the 2300 day prophecy. Now how can you know when the judgment is going to begin if you don't know when the 2300 days begin? You don't, you don't know. Do you have to have a starting point of the 2300 days to know when they end? Of course. Daniel 8 does not give us a starting point. And there's a very simple reason. At the end of the chapter we're told that Daniel could stand no more of what he was seeing and he got sick. And so Gabriel had to suspend his explanation, the vision, and the explanation of the vision. He had to, he had to stop. He said, okay, Daniel, you know, uh, I know you're in overload. <laughs> so let's just leave it here for now. And he did not complete the, the vision. Where do you suppose you would find uh, the beginning of the explanation of this vision? And the 2300 days more specifically. How about the next chapter? Do you think that would make sense? That the next chapter would give us the starting point? Now we're going to come back to that in a moment, but I need to emphasize four differences between Daniel 2 and 7 and Daniel 8. They're parallel in many ways. They begin in Persia, then Greece, then, then Rome, uh, then the judgment. They're parallel in many ways, but there are four differences between Daniel 2 and 7 and Daniel 8. The first of these differences is that in Daniel 8 there's no symbol for Babylon. It begins with Persia. Are you following me or not? And the explanation that usually is given for this, for the absence of Babylon, is well Babylon was about to fall. But that's not true because Babylon was going to rule 12 more years after this vision was given. So Babylon was not going to pass from the scene real quick because it was going to last another 12 years. Uh, the reason why this vision begins with Persia is because the 2300 days begin during the reign of Persia. If Babylon had been included, it would have given the impression that the 2300 days would begin in the time of Babylon. Are you following me or not? And so because, because the 2300 days begin during the Persian kingdom, 
there is no symbol for Babylon because that would have given the impression that the vision of the 2300 days would begin during the kingdom of Babylon. That would throw off the chronology. Are you following me or not? That's the real reason why Babylon is not mentioned. So that's the first difference between Daniel 2 and 7 and Daniel 8. Secondly, what kind of animals do you have in Daniel chapter 7? You have carnivorous, wild animals, right? A lion, a bear, a leopard, a terrible dragon beast. They're ravenous, wild beasts. What kind of beast do you have in Daniel chapter 8? They are domestic beasts and not any kind of domestic beast. They are the two main animals that were used in the daily service and the yearly service of the sanctuary. What was the animal that was sacrificed morning and evening in the sanctuary service? The ram. That's right. So you have a ram. Which animal was sacrificed on the Day of Atonement? The he, a he goat, right? So in Daniel chapter 8, what Daniel 8 is saying is, the central theme of this chapter is, the daily service as it relates also to the yearly service. In other words, it's the services of the sanctuary. Now what did the little horn try to do? It tried to take away what? The daily. The word sacrifice doesn't belong there. By the way, the word daily, I know there's lots of interpretations about the daily. You know, there are those that say the daily is the Sunday law. Although the Bible nowhere says that the daily is the Sunday law. It's the abomination of desolation, yes. But it's not uh, the daily. Every time in the Bible the word daily is used in connection with the sanctuary, it refers to things that were in the court and in the holy place. The sacrifice is called daily. And really the translation daily is not the best. It means continual. The word tamid means something that happens continually. Morning and evening, morning and evening, morning and evening. The altar of incense is called the tamid altar. Because incense was offered morning and evening, morning and evening, morning and evening. The table of the showbread is called the tamid bread. And the lamps are called tamid lamps. So somehow the little horn was going to try to interfere with the work of Jesus in the court and in the holy place. Where was Jesus while the little horn, while the little horn was ruling during the 1260 years? Where was Jesus? Was he in the most holy place or was he in the holy place? He was in the holy place, right? Jesus was in the holy place during the 1260 years. Let me ask you, where should people focus for their salvation? They should, they should focus, at least during that period, they should have focused at G, to Jesus in the holy place. They should have confessed their sins to Jesus, right? They, sh they should have received forgiveness from Jesus. They should have seen Jesus as their intercessor. But what did the papacy do? Incidentally, you also have in the court, you have the altar. The sacrifice was called daily as well. Uh, has Roman Catholicism instituted a counterfeit sacrifice? Yes. It's called the Mass. And supposedly in every, ma every Mass, Jesus is fully entire. All of Jesus is in each host. And people, even though the host tastes like a host, and some of you probably were Catholics, it's still the real flesh of Jesus. And the wine, which is fermented, that the priest drinks, which it, the cup was removed from the laity in the Middle Ages, but the, the grape juice or the, the wine, the fermented wine, uh, represents the real blood of Jesus. In other words, the, the people are really eating the flesh of Jesus, even though it doesn't taste like his flesh, and the priest is drinking the real blood of Jesus. And they believe that Jesus is sacrificed over and over and over again in each Mass. The book of Hebrews says that Jesus was sacrificed once for all. He need not die anymore. So did the little horn fiddle with the court? Yes. yes. Let me ask you, the altar of incense represents the prayers of God's saints. To whom did people pray during, during the Middle Ages? Did they pray to Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary? No, they prayed to Mary. And they prayed to the saints. For the saints to answer their prayers. 
Was the little horn trying to usurp or take away the function of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary? Absolutely. What happened with a candlestick which represents the Word of God? What happened? It looked like it was going to go out. That's why it's called the Dark Ages, hello? Because the candlestick wasn't, wasn't actually given its full light. What about the bread? The bread represent, you know, the, the, the um, seven lamps re represent God's people witnessing about the Word by the power of the Holy Spirit. The bread represents assimilating God's Word. What did the papacy do with God's Word during the 1260 years? They forbade it. They forbade the reading of God's Word. And they placed tradition instead of God's Word. So basically, what the little horn did during its period of dominion was to take away the functions of Jesus in the court and in the holy place of the sanctuary. But what Jesus says now is, because you did this with the daily, I'm going to judge you in the yearly service. And that's where the he-goat comes into perspective. The he-goat represents the Day of Atonement. Is the cleansing of the sanctuary the Day of Atonement? Yes or no? It is the Day of Atonement. And so that's the reason why this he-goat is presented in Daniel chapter 8, because we're getting the hint that the theme of the chapter is going to be taking away the, the continual functioning of Jesus as the high priest, and a judgment is going to rectify everything. Now what some people say, they'll say, but in Daniel 7, the focus is on the little horn, the focus isn't on God's people. And, and if the focus is on God's people, it's only on God's people during the 1260 years, because that's the theme there. Time, times, the dividing of time, the little horn would persecute the saints, but the judgment is going to rectify this situation. That's the argument that is used. But let me share this with you. It's true that the little horn comes into view in this judgment. But the central focus in this chapter uh, is not the um, punishment that is going to fall on the little horn. The central theme is the reward that God's saints will receive. Did we notice that this morning? The saints will receive the kingdom, the kingdom, Jesus receives the kingdom in heaven when the verdict is given. The, the central thought is the little horn persecuted God's people and killed them. So God says, but in, in the heavenly sanctuary service, in the judgment, I'm going to rectify things. And I'm going to pronounce a, a verdict in favor of the saints, contrary to what the little horn did. The little horn pronounced a sentence against God's people, but God says, in the day of atonement, I'll rectify that. And that little horn has to come into perspective because the idea is that the little horn persecuted the saints and now God is going to vindicate those saints. Are you following me or not? Furthermore, just because, just because uh, the little horn comes into view and it deals with 1260 years doesn't mean that there can't be a broader understanding. It's, it's focusing on that because that's the period that's being discussed in prophecy. Doesn't mean that it doesn't apply to all of those people who claim to be God's children. Let me give you an example. The Bible says in uh, Exodus chapter 31 that the Sabbath was a sign between Israel and God. Immediately evangelicals will take that and say, see the Sabbath was for, for the Jews, not for us, because it was a sign, be, was a sign between Israel and God. Does it say there that the Sabbath was exclusively a sign between God and Israel? No. no, it doesn't say exclusively. Why does it say, why did God say the Sabbath is a sign between me and Israel? Well, because Israel was his people at that time. Hello. He wasn't going to say, oh, the Sabbath is for the Gentiles. His theme was he was dealing with Israel at that time. So he says, this is a sign between me and my people, the people that exist now. Just because it says Israel, it doesn't mean it's restricted to Israel. Let me give you another example. In Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4, it says uh, that many of God's people were beheaded because they refused to worship the beast, his image, or receive the mark. Would that be the people who died during that little time of trouble just before the close of probation? Has pe have people died yet because they haven't worshipped the image of the beast? 
No, because the image hasn't been raised yet. The image is when the United States lends the power of the state to the papacy. That's the image. The papacy, United Church and State, when the United States joins church and state, that's an image of the papacy. And once again, the papacy will persecute like it persecuted in the past. That's the image. Has anybody died yet because they haven't received the mark of the beast? No. no. So when it says in Revelation 20 verse 4, that there's going to be individuals that did not worship the beast or his image or receive his mark, and it says that they are going to, they are going to perform a work of judgment during the thousand years. So you take that verse and you say, the only ones that are going to judge during that period are those at the very end of time who did not worship the beast or his image or receive the mark. Because that's what the verse says. But when you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you discover that there's a broader explanation. Don't just take the one verse. Don't just take Daniel 7. You have to connect Leviticus 16. You have to connect all of the passages that deal with the judgment in Scripture, not just, oh, you just stay in Daniel chapter 7. This deals just with the little horn and with the saints that were persecuted during that period. No, no, no. There's a broader explanation in other passages of Scripture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul says, How is it that you Corinthians cannot make things right among you and you go to a court of law a secular court of law to settle your differences. And then he says, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And then he says, do you not know that we will judge the world? Would that include the Apostle Paul? Would that include the Corinthians? He's writing to the Corinthians. Do you not know that you will judge the world? Yes. And then he says, do you not know that you will judge angels? So, only those at the very end of time that don't receive the mark of the beast, those are the only ones that are going to judge. No. There's a broader picture. But Revelation 20 verse 4 is dealing with those individuals who were killed during that period. But just because it's dealing with that particular theme doesn't mean that it has a broader explanation. Are you with me or not? So don't allow anybody to intimidate you by saying, oh no, that's, that, the, the theme is the little horn. Yes, but there's a broader picture than this. Now, third, third difference. There's only one symbol in Daniel 8 for pagan and papal Rome. And you say, why is there only one symbol? The reason why is because uh, if another symbol had been introduced, it would ruin the symmetry of the chapter that deals with the two beasts of the sanctuary service. And so basically, he's, just, he's going back to discuss the little horn. He's not putting everything in there that was before the little horn. He's just basically talking about the little horn uh, from a political perspective and from a religious perspective. To introduce another beast here would have ruined the sanctuary symmetry of the beast that was sacrificed in the daily service and the beast that was sacrificed in the yearly service. And then the fourth difference is that Daniel chapter 2 ends with the setting up of Christ's everlasting kingdom, right? God will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Does Daniel 7 also end with the time when Christ and his saints will take over the kingdom? Yes, but Daniel 8 does not end with the setting up of Christ's everlasting kingdom. It's missing. So the beginning of Daniel 8, you're missing Babylon. And at the end of the vision, you're, you're missing the setting up of Christ's everlasting kingdom. And so the question is, why is the setting up of the kingdom? It only takes you to the ending of the 2300 days. 2300 days, the sanctuary will be cleansed. Up to that point, the beginning of the judgment. It doesn't take you beyond that. And so the question is, why didn't Gabriel explain what was going to take place after the 2300 days and take Daniel all the way to the setting up of the everlasting kingdom like you find in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. The reason is very simple. Daniel got sick. And Gabriel was not able to complete the explanation of the vision that, uh, Daniel, that he gave Daniel. And so Gabriel had to suspend the explanation of the last part of the vision. So it, it's kind of, it's aborted early, if you please. Now, so what is the central theme of Daniel chapter 8? 
The sanctuary. What particular aspect of a sanctuary? Unto 2300 days, and the sanctuary shall be what? Shall be cleansed. In other words, the central theme of Daniel 8 is the judgment. But as I mentioned before, Daniel 8 does not give us a date for the beginning of the judgment. So where would you expect to find the date? Well, probably in the next chapter, right? In Daniel 9. Now, in Daniel chapter 9, we, we receive uh, information on the beginning point of the 2300 day prophecy. Um, and that beginning point is with the beginning of the 70 weeks. 70 weeks are cut off from the 2300 days. Ellen White has this interesting statement. I don't think this is in your syllabus. I kind of added this. You know, I add things as I go along. Uh, there's not a lot of additions, but there's a few. Um, notice Ellen White understood that, that Daniel had not been given all the information. It says, upon the occasion just described, she's talked about Daniel 9, the angel Gabriel imparted to Daniel all the instruction which he was then able to receive. So was all the information given in Daniel 8 and 9? No, not all of it was given. Only what he was able to what? To receive. Then she says, a few years afterward, however, the prophet desired to learn more of the subjects not yet, yet, not yet fully explained. Were there some things that were not fully explained yet after Daniel 8 and 9? Yes. What hadn't been explained? When the prophecy begins, when the time period begins, and taking you to the events beyond the ending of the 2300 days. Were there, was, after the 2300 days, were there going to be a lot of prophetic events that were going to take place? Sure. But Daniel 8 doesn't mention any of those. And so, and so basically she says, a few years afterward, however, the prophet desired to learn more of the subjects not yet fully explained, and again, again set himself to seek light and wisdom from God. And where does that happen? This is very important in Daniel 10 and 11. In Daniel 11, you're going to have the fullest and complete explanation of what was left unexplained to Daniel. And we'll come back, back to that in a while. Uh, Ellen White explains, in those days, she's quoting Daniel chapter 10, in those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks, I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all. What is Daniel doing? He's fasting and he's praying because he wants more what? He wants understanding of the things that were not explained to him in Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 9. Because Ellen White says in Daniel chapter 9, uh, Daniel was only given part of the picture according to what he was able to receive. So is Daniel 9 related to the theme of the judgment? Is Daniel 9 related to Daniel 8? Yes. Is it related to the judgment? Yes. Yeah, what does it give us? It gives us a starting point of the 2300 day prophecy. Is that going to help us know when it ends? Yes. When the judgment begins? Yes, so Daniel 9 is linked with the idea of judgment and the 2300 days. Are you with me so far? Then we go to Daniel chapter 10. It's a fascinating chapter. One of the, one of the least studied chapters in Daniel. And yet one of the most important chapters in Daniel. It's the introduction to chapter 11, actually. It's the, the um, how would I say, it's the inauguration, if you please, of the vision of Daniel chapter 11. Uh, those of you who have the syllabus, there's an entire chapter at the end of the syllabus on Daniel 10. It's not an easy read. It's complex because you're dealing with a lot of historical details. You're dealing with a lot of intertextual connections between Daniel and Revelation. But please spend time with it and gain understanding. It's a very important chapter that deals with, uh, particularly with Daniel chapter 10. Now, what do we have in Daniel chapter 10? In order for the prophecy of the 2300 days to be fulfilled, especially the 70 weeks, it was necessary for the kings of Persia to give certain decrees for Israel to go back to their land, to rebuild the temple, the city, the walls, and to restore a functioning Hebrew theocracy. Would you agree with that? 
was there, were there going to be decrees for God's people to their land and reestablish the, their religion? Could the Messiah that didn't happen? No. If that didn't happen, the Messiah couldn't come. So, so basically, the, the Persian kings had to give certain decrees. Uh, the first of them was given by Cyrus in the year 536, uh, where he authorized the Jews to go back to their land to rebuild the temple. Then that was, that was suspended. And in the year 520, it was restored. The decree was restored by Darius I, uh, which is not the same Darius the Great that, uh, that conquered Babylon. And then, of course, you had a decree further. After that, you had the decree of Artaxerxes. So there had to be certain decrees that would allow God's people to go back to their land to reestablish the Hebrew theocracy uh, so that the 70 week prophecy could begin on time. Do you think Satan knew uh, this, that uh, the, the Persians had to give certain decrees? Think the devil could read uh, the prophecy of the 70 weeks? You better believe he could. So, what did he do? He tried to influence the minds of the Persian kings to try and prevent them from allowing Israel to return to their land. All you have to do is read the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. The people that remained in the land, the Samaritans fought tooth and nail to not allow Israel to go back and to reestablish the theocracy. Remember when Nehemiah was building the wall, right? How the enemies tried to keep him from building the wall by using different strategies. But what, what Daniel tells us that you don't see in these chapters, because these chapters just say it was the Samaritans, it was the people of the land. What Daniel 10 tells you is where the battle really is taking place, which is behind the scenes. In other words, what you see in history is only the visible manifestation of what is happening in the invisible world. So the kings of Persia are being influenced by Satan to Uh, not give the decrees that will allow the 70 week prophecy to begin on time. You see, if the, if the theocracy is not established, the prophecy of the 2300 days could not begin to be fulfilled and God's plan would be frustrated. And so what happens? You read at the end of chapter 10, it says that Gabriel is struggling with the minds of uh, the kings of Persia, trying to get them to give the decrees. And at the same time, the prince of the kingdom of Persia, who is Satan, we're going to read it in a minute, is trying to influence the minds of the kings of Persia not to favor the, the Hebrew nation so that they don't go back to their land. Because the devil does not want the 70 week prophecy to begin to be fulfilled. He doesn't want the 2300 day prophecy to begin to be fulfilled. And if he can keep Israel in the land, in, in, in uh, Persia, captive, then these things will not be established. Notice how Ellen White comments on this in Prophets and Kings 571 and 572. She gives us an interesting description of the battle that was taking place. By the way, Gabriel could not prevail against the prince of Persia. You read it there in chapter 10. He, Gabriel, who took Lucifer's place, by the way, in heaven, after Lucifer fell from heaven, uh, One, the one who called Jesus forth from the tomb, among other things. You know, Gabriel struggled, it says in Daniel chapter 10, with the kings of Persia, and he was not able to prevail. So finally, Michael came. Christ. Michael came, and he joined forces with Gabriel, and the Persian kings gave the decrees right on time. Does Daniel 10 have anything to do with the 2300 day prophecy? It absolutely does. So what is the central theme of Daniel 10? The battle for the decree that will begin the 2300 days. What is the central theme of Daniel chapter 9? The beginning date for the judgment. What is the central theme of Daniel chapter 8? On to 2300 days and the sanctuary will be cleansed. Are we dealing with the same theme in all these chapters? Same central theme? Absolutely. Now, we come to the most exciting part now. Daniel 11. Now God is going to say to Daniel, Okay, Daniel, you remember the vision that I suspended the explanation of? He says, Now I'm going to start again where I started in that vision. I'm going to start with Persia. And I'm going to take you all the way down the course of time, not only to the ending of the 2300 days, but I'm going to take you to the very end of time 
I'm going to take you to the time that Michael stands up. By the way, that's the end of the investigative judgment. I'm going to take you beyond that to the time of trouble. And I'm going to take you even beyond that to when the eternal kingdom is reestablished. So he's going to begin where Daniel 8 began, where it was suspended. He says, now I'm not going to suspend it. Now I'm going to take you all the way to the end of the explanation. Let's examine this. Are you following me? We'll just follow this here. Now that which was begun and not finished in Daniel 8 will be completed in chapter 11. It is important to underline that there was no new vision in this chapter. In chapter 11 there's no new vision. It's an explanation. An explanation of what? It must be an explanation of the earlier vision. Because there is no vision. It's just an explanation. This indicates that Daniel 11 is the explanation of the vision of Daniel 8. Because there is no other vision between Daniel 8 and Daniel 11. Now, as in Daniel 8, the explanation in Daniel 11 begins with the kingdom of what? Persia. Is that where Daniel 8 began with Persia? Yes. yes. And you find the verses here. We don't have time to read all the verses. You can find the verses here in parentheses. Then the explanation continues with what kingdom? Greece. Greece. And then the first king of Greece is mentioned. The four divisions of Greece are mentioned. Is that parallel to Daniel 8? Yes. Absolutely. Then it describes the dominion of pagan Rome. And the key verse there is Daniel 11, 22, where it says that it would be a power that would break the prince of the covenant. Who is the prince of the covenant? Jesus. What power broke the prince of the covenant? It was Rome. Pagan Rome. And then... In Daniel 11, 30 to 39, you have papal Rome during the 1260 years. Up to this point, you know, Daniel has already seen this in the vision that was given in Daniel chapter 8. But now I want you to notice that in this uh, explanation that is given in Daniel chapter 11, now Gabriel is going to take Daniel beyond the period of the little horn. And, uh, and it says, the deadly wound, by the way, is referred to in Daniel 11, verse 40. It says, at the time of the end, the king of the south will attack the king of the north. You say, now what, what is that, king of the south and king of the north? Well, the Bible calls this last power that will oppress God's people by different names. In 2 Thessalonians 2, this power is called the man of sin. In 1 John 2, he's called the Antichrist. In Daniel 7 and 8, he's called the little horn. In Revelation 17, it's called the harlot. In Matthew 24, this power is called the abomination of desolation. They're all referring to the same last power from different perspectives. So the king of the north here is the last power. And in verse 40, it says that the, at the time of the end, the king of the south, which geographically the king of the south was Egypt will attack the king of the north the king of the north is Babylon you can go to the book of Jeremiah for that Babylon was the king of the north because the Babylonians you know whenever they came to attack Israel they would even though Babylon was east north and east they would not come across the Arabian desert what they would do is they would go across the fertile crescent And then they would come down uh, the area that today is Lebanon uh, and, and that area up there, uh, north of Israel. They would come down uh, from the north. So Babylon is the king of the north. And are we dealing with literal Babylon at the end of time? No. Are we dealing with, uh, with uh, Saddam Hussein's Iraq? No. no. We're dealing with spiritual Babylon. Because it's a harlot that sits on multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. So it's a global system. It's a global apostate system. Religious system. Would Egypt be literal? Well, the king of the north is Babylon in the end time, and it's symbolic. Would Egypt also be symbolic? Of course. What is the central characteristic of ancient Egypt? The Egypt of the Exodus. Atheism. Do you remember Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord? I know not the Lord. I don't know who he is. Atheism. 
You can read this in Great Controversy. Now let me ask you, at the time of the end, did an atheistic power that openly claimed to be atheistic attack the papacy? Which is, which is spiritual Babylon? Yes. What, what is it called? The French Revolution. That's right. So when does the time of the end begin? Actually it begins in 1798. Because the French Revolution, even though the French Revolution ends in 1797, the climax of it is the captivity of the Pope. That is a consequence, that's the aftermath of the French Revolution, if you please, the taking captive of the Pope. And so, it's interesting to notice that here it says, at the time of the end, the king of the north, the king of the south will, you know, the, the King James says, will push at the king of the, of the north. Well, you know, uh, that's not a good translation. A good translation is like in Daniel 8, it says that the, that the uh, he-goat uh, came and attacked the ram. And it's the same word that is used. In other words, this is talking about an, a, a frontal attack against the king of the north, which is what happened uh, between um, 17, uh, the late 17th century leading up to 1798. So I want to read a statement from Ellen White where she clearly tells us when the time of the end begins. Uh, this statement is found in Great Controversy 355 and 356. This is not in your syllabus. This is one of those additions. Uh, Great Controversy 355 and 356. Listen carefully to when the time of the end begins. The message of salvation has been preached in all ages. But this message, that's the first angel's message, is a part of the gospel which could be proclaimed only in the last days. For only then would it be true that the hour of judgment had come. Are you understanding that? Could Paul preach the hour of God's judgment has come? Could Luther preach the hour of God's judgment has come? Could Wesley preach the hour of God's judgment has come? No. Because the other hour of God's judgment hadn't come. So this could only be preached in the last days. The announcement of the beginning of the judgment. It continues saying, the prophecies present a succession of events leading down to the opening of the judgment. Could the succession of events be understood? Yes. But could the final event be understood before the time of the end? No. She continues saying, this is especially true of the book of Daniel. But that part of his prophecy, which related to the last days, Daniel was bidden to close up and seal to the time of the end. Not till we reach this time, could a message concerning the judgment be proclaimed based on the fulfillment of these prophecies? But at the time of the end, says the prophet, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall, knowledge shall be increased. Uh, then she says, no such message, the first angel's message, has ever been given in past ages. Paul, as we have seen, did not preach it. He pointed his brethren into the then far distant future for the coming of the Lord. The reformers did not proclaim it. Martin Luther placed the judgment about 300 years in the future from his day. But now notice this. But since, seven, whoops, but since 1798, the book of Daniel has been unsealed. So when does the time of the end begin? 1798. But since 1798, the book of Daniel has been unsealed. Knowledge of the prophecies has increased. So what is it? The, the technology and scientific knowledge? Is that what it's talking about? No. Knowledge of the prophecies has increased and many have proclaimed the solemn message of the judgment what? Of the judgment near. So at the time of the end did atheism attack the papacy? Babylon, spiritually speaking. It happened just the way prophecy indicated. Now, we go to the next point, where it says the vision. The vision then takes us beyond the 1260 years of papal oppression to the final persecution against God's people when the king of the north's wound is healed and he overflows the world. Let me ask you, is the papacy going to have a resurrection? The Bible says its deadly wound was what? was healed, and all of New Zealand wondered after the beast. <laughs> New Zealand too. The whole world, what? Wondered after the beast. So is this beast that ruled for 1260 years, 
Is this beast that received the deadly wound going to uh, resurrect? Yes. It's going to resurrect. Is it going to act in the future the way it acted in the past? Yes. Most certainly yes. Is it going to join church and state like it did in the past? Let me ask you. People don't understand what the word papacy means. Papacy and Roman Catholic Church are not the same. It's not the same to say papacy as Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church did not receive a deadly wound in 1798. It was the papacy that received the deadly wound. You say, well, what's the difference? Let me ask you this. When the Pope was taken captive, were, was Mass still celebrated in Catholic churches? Did people still take their kids to be baptized? Their little babies to be baptized? Did people still go to the confessional? So did the Roman Catholic Church as a church continue to function? Yes. The word papacy means the union of church and state. That's papacy. It's not the church aspect. It's the union of church and state. And what happened in 1798 is that the state said goodbye. Or rather I should say, see you later. <laughs> so when is the deadly wound? If the papacy's deadly wound is that the state turns against it, what would be the healing of the deadly wound? when the state once again favors it. How many armies does the papacy have? How many tanks? How many, how many, uh, how big of an air force? None. But they have all. You see the genius of the papacy, if you can use the word genius, the genius of the papacy is that the papacy is a parasite. That's, I know that's not, not politically correct. The papacy is a parasite. The papacy is, is a leech. It attaches itself to the state, and then when it attaches itself to the state, it has all power, all the power of the state. Then it has lots of armies, and it has lots of tanks, and it has lots of airplanes, and it has a whole nations with it. And so the wound is healed when the papacy recovers the ability to use the state. And let me ask you, which is the country that is going to lend the sword first of all? America. The United States. And Ellen White says that when the United States does that, every country in the globe will follow its example. Are you following me? So, if you read, continue reading Daniel 11, it says there that the king of the north turns, king of the south turns against the king of the north, attacks it, but then you continue reading, it says the king of the north uh, actually rises against the king of the south. And to make a long story short, he overwhelms the, the king of the south and conquers the king of the south. And he extends all over, geographically, all over the Holy Land. But the Holy Land, of course, represents the world in the end time. Because what was local in the Old Testament now becomes global. Because you're dealing with spiritual worldwide systems. It's spoken of in language, local language, but it's universal in its fulfillment. And so this culminates, the king of the north culminates when, he's, when he actually goes out with the intention of destroying and annihilating many. You can read that in verse 44. Has the wound been healed at that point? Yes. Something happens that, that uh, angers the king of the north. Why does he go out to destroy and annihilate God's people. It says because tidings from the north and from the east trouble the king of the north. So when the king of the north is conquering, he's overwhelming the world, he's got his power back, there's a certain news that comes from the, king, from the north and from the east that troubles him and it says that because of that he goes out to, to try and destroy God's people. What are the tidings from the north and from the east? You have to go to the book of Revelation to understand what those tidings are. Where does the seal of the living God come from? You can read Revelation chapter 7. It says, I saw another angel with a seal coming from the east and he had the seal of the living God. So what is it that angers the king of the north? The sealing message, the Sabbath message. What about the north? Well, we usually think of the, of the north in geographical terms. We say, well, which way is north here? Help me along. I'm kind of confused. Which way is north? This way is north? Okay, we usually think of north, south, east, and west in a linear fashion. But in the Bible, north is up and south is down. 
North is heaven. Because Lucifer said, I will ascend to the heights of the north to occupy God's throne. And by the way, in math, what are the positive and neg negative uh, points of the quadrant? The one on top is positive, right? And the one on the right is positive. The one on the left is negative, and the one on the bottom is negative. You say, well, what does that have to do with all of this? The fact is that God's points of the compass are the north and the east. Because the sun rises in the east and it reaches its highest intensity in the north when it's overhead. The west is Satan's point of the compass because it's where darkness begins. And the south is where darkness reaches its deepest intensity. You just read Revelation 11 and you'll find that this is true. So what the king of the north is trying to do, he's trying to usurp what? The papacy is trying to usurp the position of the true king of the north, who is God in heaven. Are you following me or not? And so, and so what happens is, the king of the north, he goes out to destroy God's people, his wound has been healed, and then this news comes. Is there a message that comes from heaven, from the north in Revelation? I saw another angel descend from heaven. Oh, no, not, not that one particularly. Oh, the whole earth, he came down from heaven, the whole earth was lightened with his glory. And then he calls people, God's people, to come out of Babylon. Do you think that's going to make Babylon happy? <laughs> See, it's the sealing message and the message concerning the fall of Babylon that enrages the king of the north. And when chapter 11 ends, it says that the king of the north sets up the tents of his palace in a strategic place to deliver a final death blow against God's people. That's the same death decree of Revelation 13 verse 15 where it speaks about whoever does not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Are you with me? And so it looks when Daniel 11 verse 45 ends, <laughs> God's people are in jeopardy. You say God's people are finished. But what does the very next verse say? At that time, Michael shall stand up. What does the standing up of Michael mean? What does Michael shall stand up? What does that mean? It means that Jesus now takes over his kingdom. In a minute, I'm going to, uh, you know, you can read that in, uh, I won't take the time. Daniel 11, verses 2 and 3 uses the same expression, stand up, and it refers to a ruler who begins to rule, rule over his kingdom. So how can Jesus begin to rule over his kingdom? Does his kingdom have to already be made up in order for him to rule over it? Yes. Sure. When was his kingdom made up? At the judgment. When the last person was judged, his kingdom was complete. So the standing up of Michael means that the kingdom of Jesus is complete. Everybody has been judged and has been revealed who are the subjects of Christ's kingdom. Then Jesus stands up, probation. That's the close of probation. But that's not the end. Because it says that there will be a time of trouble after Michael stands up. There will be a time of trouble such as never has been seen in the history of the world. But then it says, but at that time, during the time of trouble, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. Question is, when were they written in the book? When was their name confirmed in the book? It was in the judgment. That's right. Everyone who is found written in the book. So, Daniel 12 verse 1 gives us the ending point of the judgment that began at the end of the 2300 days. Are, are you following my point? So Daniel 8 only takes you to the time when the judgment begins. When the 2300 days end. But Daniel chapter... Uh, 11, chapter 12 verse 1 takes you to the point when Michael stands up and that judgment ends. And then if you read on, you'll see in verses 2 and 3, it says in verses 2 and 3 that uh, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth will arise. That's a special resurrection of those who died in the message of the third angel and of those who, who pierced Jesus, those who crucified Christ. They will resurrect actually before Jesus arrives above the earth, uh, they, will, they will see the entire second coming of Jesus. Read Great Controversy 635 to 637. There you have all the chronology 
And so they'll resurrect. They'll stand with the 144,000, those who are alive. They'll stand together and they'll see the entire second coming of Jesus. And then Ellen White explains, and she has scripture to support it in Great Controversy. She says that when Jesus is above the earth, then he calls those who died before 1844 from the grave. And at that point, they're all caught up together in the clouds and they begin their journey to heaven to, for their working vacation. <laughs> because there's a job to do during the millennium. God's people will judge the world and they will judge angels. Can't be the righteous angels, they don't need any judgment. So it must be the wicked angels. And then in Daniel 12 verse 3, it says that God's saints will shine as stars forever in God's kingdom. Did we go for a full circle in Daniel 11 and 12? Yes. And now here's the interesting thing. Immediately after verse 3, Daniel is told, seal the book, close the book. So what is the book? What was written immediately before? Are you with me? So let me ask you, is the Adventist view some convoluted invention like many of our own theologians are saying? Absolutely not. Internally you can prove that the traditional Adventist view is correct. And when we get to Revelation chapter 10, hang on to your seat. Because we're going to see that all of the events that took place between 1798 and 1844 were predicted in minute detail before it happened. Now I don't know what time is supposed to end. I don't see Doug around here, so... What time... I'm so, oh, there you are. <laughs> he can see me, I can't see you. Should we cut it off here? Okay, we'll cut it off here. Tomorrow uh, morning at 11 and again at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, we are going to start studying um, Revelation chapter 10. In your syllabus, it's in your syllabus. If you want to get a head start, you can read it tonight. And uh, it's going to be a fascinating study. It's amazing. There's no, there is no passage in all of the Bible that proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is God's remnant church than Revelation chapter 10. And I know that the remnant church has problems. Serious problems. But it's still God's remnant church and the Lord is going to take care of that by, by bringing a shaking in the church. We just need to make sure that we're not the ones shaken. That we remain firm. So did you understand what we studied tonight? Very good. All right. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for uh, the message that you have given to your church. We thank you, Lord, that you have called us to be that remnant that proclaims this final present truth message to the world. I ask, Lord, that you will help us to fulfill the commission that you have given to us. Thank you, Father, for being such a wonderful God, revealing the end from the beginning so that we will not have to face any surprises. Be with us now as we go our separate ways, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.